When a man was found after jumping off a roof, the last thing investigators thought of was a homicide, though this man had a very peculiar note in his pocket addressed to police. The real crime scene was in a different location, and more disturbing than even trained professionals knew how to handle. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and today's case is about Zachary Bowen and Addie Hall. And this case has actually been extensively covered in the book called Shake the Devil Off, A True Story of the Murder That Rocked New Orleans by Ethan Brown, which I will have a link down below as that was a major source in finding information in this case. So it was 2005 in New Orleans and 29-year-old Adrian Hall, who went by Addie, and 28-year-old Zachary Bowen lived in a quaint apartment together in the French Quarter. Now, they had met at the Hogs Bar, where Zachary and Addie both worked. They were just the bartender. Zachary worked a night shift, and then Addie worked the shift after him, and so they had brief moments together. But during these brief moments, Zachary developed a huge crush. You see, Addie was this free, fiery spirit. She loved to write poetry. She loved to make costumes, and Zachary absolutely adored her. But Addie wasn't quite sure about him. She thought the way that he kind of showed off to customers, the way that he talked to people was kind of cheesy. It was a bit of a performance. And so she believed he was this people pleaser and didn't really think much of it. But little did she know they had quite a bit in common, including dropping out of high school before traveling the world and then landing in New Orleans. They both worked very hard to make rent and survive and Zachary continued to chase Addie until she agreed to have a drink with him between their shifts. Hours went by during this drink and they were still talking and soon enough Addie was telling her friends about him. They could see how happy she was with him and they seemed to be the perfect match. They looked so cute together. Addie was only five feet tall and Zachary was around 6'10". But it wasn't exactly smooth sailing for this couple. You see, Addie was very cautious about Zachary's past due to the fact that he was in the military. Now, her father was a veteran and so she knew how traumatized soldiers could be. But Addie followed her heart even when the red flags started showing. Though Addie herself had some red flags that her friends and family would talk about, she would be very abusive and angry when she was drinking, and these were often described as her dark spells by her friends, where she would get into these bar fights. She would even try to fight with them. But all of these worries about the two, Zachary and Addie, and the red flags that they could see within each other were kind of back of mind, especially because they were falling in love, but also because during this time, everyone was preparing for Hurricane Katrina. So by August of 2005, some had evacuated the area. In fact, a lot of New Orleans was evacuated, but Zachary and Addie decided to stay. Now, Zachary told the frightened Addie that he would not leave her side. So together, they would wait for the hurricane to pass in their very small apartment. Well, this was Addie's apartment at this time. But Zachary then had to tell Addie a secret that he had been keeping. That he not only had one child, but two, and also an ex-wife that wasn't necessarily an ex yet. His ex-wife's name was Lana, and Lana wanted him to come over and be with her and the kids during the hurricane, and was actually quite upset when Zachary told her that he couldn't because he was going to stay with Addie. Lana so desperately didn't want to be alone that she even invited Addie to come over, but they didn't want this. But Addie had never heard of this part of Zach's past and was a bit shocked and upset that he waited this long to tell her. But at this point, they were in the thick of the honeymoon phase of falling in love and so they didn't leave each other's side for days as the hurricane passed. Now, this wasn't a little storm. If you didn't know, Hurricane Katrina ended with New Orleans having 80% of their city flooded with 200,000 houses destroyed and around 1,800 deaths. You could hear screams coming from everywhere when you walked outside, and it was said to be the deadliest hurricane in U.S. history. Friends and family of Addie and Zachary were wondering if they were even still alive. They couldn't get a hold of them. The electricity was out, and Zachary's ex-wife, Lana, also believed that her children's father was deceased. Addie and Zachary had survived. They had actually gone out and began helping neighbors clean everything up. They joined up with other survivors. They rebuilt the town, the community, 
And they did so with happy hearts. They were actually thrilled to be doing this. They would start bonfires on old mattresses. They would open up cans of beans and soup and share with everybody around. And due to the positivity of these survivors and these groups coming together, New York Times actually made it out to New Orleans where they were interviewing for an article. This was called Holdouts on Dry Ground Say Why Leave Now? And Addie and Zachary were actually interviewed for this and they made a statement where they joked that the way to make sure that police officers were regularly coming by during this time was that they would have a friend of theirs flash her breasts to get the police coming back. Because you see, at this time, the police were very much outnumbered, but Addie and Zachary became celebrities in New Orleans. And as they found new ways to survive in these times, their relationship seemed to thrive. Yet as things started to go back to normal, real life seemed to get in the way of their love. And when Zachary's ex-wife, Lana, found out he was still alive through the newspaper where he had given that statement, she was so angry when she realized that he just hadn't contacted her. So she demanded that Zachary start to help with the children. And this was all because she had taken care of them all by herself during the hurricane. So Zachary had to get to work to start to help and Addie did the same. So Zachary was working at a grocery store, Addie at a bar. The electricity was back on, the bills needed to be paid. The city was no longer in ruins, at least as much as it once was, and they had to return to their adult lives. But one year later, in October of 2006, the couple who were known to have survived were known for something much more horrific. On October 17th, the police in New Orleans would be called to a hotel called the Omni Royal. Callers claimed that a man had jumped off a roof and his body was found covered in cigarette burns. Now, a search of this man's person would find dog tags and the keys to an apartment. So he was identified as Zachary Bowen, but there was also a note found in his pocket addressed police only. Friends of Zachary did not see this coming, that he would take his life. They said that he was quiet for a few days earlier in the month, which was strange for Zachary, but that week prior to him jumping, he was out of the bars drinking with friends. In fact, a day prior, he was happy and even paid for friends' drinks and their lap dances and... He even called his ex-wife Lana and asked her if she wanted to come down and party because it was technically their anniversary. Now, Lana said that she had asked about Addie and he had said she had driven him crazy, so he drove her out of town. Nothing seemed off to his friends though, except for a friend named Squirrel. Nickname, obviously, but this was also Zachary's drug dealer. Now, these two, Squirrel and Zachary, had a special bond due to being in the military together. They had once had a conversation where Squirrel told Zachary that he had to sew people back together while being at war, but Zachary refused to talk about his time. Now, when he jumped, this was about 8 p.m. at night, and Squirrel would come forward to say that four hours earlier at 4 p.m., he had tried to wake Squirrel up and wanted to go and party again. However, Squirrel was still hungover from the night before, so he said he didn't want to party that night. Now, Squirrel had actually been quite suspicious of Zachary's story about Addie and their breakup because he had said that Addie tried to steal money from him and then she fled. When Zachary was telling this story to another friend of his and Addie's named Caps or nicknamed Caps, his first thought was that Addie was dead, but he didn't want to think that his friend Zachary could have been the one to have killed her. So later that day, around four hours later, the day he jumped, he was said to be acting strange to the bartender at the Omni Hotel bar. He had been walking along the edge of the roof with a drink in his hand going back and forth. He had opened a tab at the bar. So that's why the bartender was actually watching him because he was acting so strange. The bartender thought he was just going to leave without paying. So as the bartender watched, Zachary jumped off the roof to his death. But little did investigators know at this point that this jumper's girlfriend, Addie, hadn't been seen in a while. Her friends and family had been asking Zachary if he had seen her, and they didn't know at this point that she had moved into an apartment with him. He had told them that she basically dumped him and moved back to her hometown of North Carolina, but she hadn't told anybody this. Now, Addie's own boss from the bar called her several times when she stopped showing up from work, but Addie never answered her phone and never called her back. This bar owner suspected something was wrong and she had even overheard a conversation between Addie and Zachary 
And this was while Addie was working the bar and she would often dance. She would flirt with guys to get tips and she asked Zachary for some space because he had shown up and was quite angry. But Zachary started telling her if he couldn't have her, nobody can. So as investigators pulled this note out of Zachary's pocket, they believed it was going to strictly be a suicide note. However, upon reading it, they quickly rushed to his apartment. Now their landlord would tell police that on October 5th, which was 12 days prior to this, Zachary had come to him saying that Addie was threatening to kick him out of their shared apartment. The landlord told him to work it out with her and he said that he was sure that they would. Zachary's boss told the police that he hadn't shown up for work for a couple of days after that time. And when he finally did, he looked like he hadn't cleaned himself or had been home in a while. He looked completely unshaven. But investigators were at this apartment by 10 p.m. at 826 in Rampart because they were searching for another body. The landlord let them in, claiming there was no body. But upon entering, they noticed it was 60 degrees, quite cold, and all of the walls, especially in the bathroom, were spray painted saying things like, please call my wife. Please help me stop the pain. I love her. I'm a total failure. And look in the oven. There was a huge silver arrow pointed to the oven. And on the oven itself, it said, don't look. You see, this suicide note was also a confession. It read, this is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 826 M Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend, Addie, in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. Now, when the news broke of Zachary's death, Addie's friends spoke of the tumultuous relationship that they had after the hurricane had passed. As everything went back to normal in New Orleans, Zachary and Addie were said to be constantly fighting. It was an on and off situation. They were using alcohol and drugs to try to make things better, but this was only making them angrier and more explosive. And this actually led to an arrest of Addie for aggravated assault for pulling a firearm on a random man on the street. Zachary actually refused to bail her out for this, but then Zachary was arrested for possession of marijuana and Addie did bail him out. Addie had once confided in her friends that one night they were drinking, they were playing games, and Zachary hit her for the first time. Though when he sobered up the next morning, he was angry at himself for doing so, and then he fled to Portland for weeks and told his friends he was done with New Orleans. Addie went to work the next day with bruises and told her boss and her friends what happened. But the couple began communicating again over the phone, and a few weeks later, he did return to Addie. For a while, it was a bit better or so it seemed until they began using harder drugs and so this escalated the anger and the fights between them. One day Addie was said to push Zachary out of the home and he began to bang on the door screaming to be let in and the neighbors called the cops and he was taken to jail. During this time Zachary was speaking to his mother and she claimed that he was always apologizing for something saying that everything he did was a bad decision. But while being on and off, Addie and Zachary decided to move in together in September of 2006 after Addie was evicted from her previous place. Now, Zachary was making pretty good money, more than Addie, so he was the one to put down the deposit of the first month and the last month's rent. But Addie was telling her friends that she was planning on leaving Zachary for good. So she went to the landlord and she actually signed a six month lease in only her name without telling Zachary. Now this was allegedly due to her finding out that Zachary was cheating on her with a man, but that's when Zachary would try to talk to his landlord about this lease and Addie kicking him out. And this night that he stated that they would figure it out, he would actually murder her. When investigators found the crime scene, Zachary's ex-wife, Lana, was actually called because he'd written, please call my wife on the wall. And she was informed that her children's father had killed his girlfriend. Now she was shocked and she called her friend who said that she had watched the news on TV, but that she was not going to tell Lana what actually happened and all of the details. Lana then had to call Zachary's mother to inform her and his mother started screaming and crying. You see, Zachary was still Lana's legal husband. And she had even asked him a few weeks prior to his death to finalize the divorce, but it hadn't gone through. So she was in charge of his belongings, what to do with his body. And they ultimately decided to cremate Zachary and leave his ashes with Lana. 
but Lana was having a hard time not flushing them down the toilet. And she was trying really hard to see the person that he was instead of the person that he became. Because unfortunately, this note found in Zachary's pocket was not an hallucination. It was not an exaggeration or a lie. Investigators would find body parts on the stove, in the oven, and in the fridge. There was a cooked head in the pot on the stove, hands and feet in another, and cooked legs in the oven seasoned with herbs. Inside the fridge were the remainder of the remains. Detectives knew this was Addie Hall without even needing identification, which was going to be difficult anyway because her body was torn apart. Inside this apartment, investigators then found a journal that actually belonged to Addie, but was written in by Zachary dated October 16th, 2006, a day prior to when Zachary took his life. It read, today is Monday, 16th, October, 2 a.m. I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday, October 5th. I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. Halfway through the task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene you are now in, came after a while. I scared myself not by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved for one and a half years and then desecrating her body, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known for forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend the 1500 cash I had being happy until I killed myself. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends I may have had. I didn't contact any of my family, so that'll explain the shock, and had a fantastic time living out my days. It's just about time now. The only numbers left are friends and family members, so go to work. Zach Bowen. He then wrote a list of his failures, saying friends, jobs, military, marriage, love. And while dismembering his girlfriend, he would stop and he would go see his children and his ex-wife and asked if the next week after he cleaned up his apartment, they could come and hang out with him. Then he went home back to work on the body. To investigators, it didn't make sense that he could do something so horrific to someone that he claimed to love. They had to actually take breaks outside of the crime scene. And then next day, the New Orleans Police Department Chief, Anthony Cantella said, I would imagine that he was in some serious mental anguish and pain. I couldn't fathom to think what caused him to do it. But he then also confirmed that Zachary was not a cannibal. Not at all. Even though the media was claiming this. But how did this all turn horrific so fast? Well, Zachary's family said that when he was younger, he was charismatic, handsome, he wanted to be an English teacher. And when Zachary was 17, he had taken a road trip with his father to New Orleans and decided he wanted to stay. And that's where he met his ex-wife, Lana. They got pregnant, but then Lana learned his age and no longer wanted to be with him after learning that she was 10 years older. They soon had a son named Jackson and Zachary was with him as much as he could be. But during this time, he also proposed to Lana and she did finally agree. But right before they wed, she found out that she was pregnant once again. And so they married, they had a daughter named Lily and Zachary would enlist in the army not long after to make money for the family. And also because his grandfather had done so as well. So in 2000, he was deployed to Germany and at first his family didn't join him. So he worked security on the American base for about a year when his wife and children finally joined him. By 2002, Zachary was sent to Iraq and Lana and the kids remained in Germany. But while missing his family, Zachary was said not to realize the toll that the war was taking on him, but wanted to get out of the military, especially when Lana fell ill with hepatitis C. She could barely take care of the children and the army refused to let Zachary stay in Germany to take care of her. So at this time, Zachary decided to fail his fitness test and was generally discharged, even though this would mean that they would receive no monthly benefits. Now, Lana knew nothing about this, that he had faked his test so he could be discharged because Zachary was fine. He did physical activity well, 
he wouldn't have been discharged if he didn't want to be. So Zachary, Lana, and the kids went back to New Orleans, but the couple separated soon after because Lana said this wasn't the man that she fell in love with. He was very distant. He was secretive. She just no longer wanted to be with him. She said that the whole point of him being in the military was so that he didn't have to bartend and she didn't have to strip, but now they were back to square one. But Zachary's PTS from the war was serious. Though he covered it well, his friends who knew him they were able to see that he was different. He had very few emotions and only few actually knew about the flashbacks that he was often having of his best friend dying in a car explosion and also the guilt that he felt because he had befriended a young child while over in the war and once they found out that this child had befriended an American soldier and accepted candy from him, that child and the entire family was massacred. But for a while, Lana and Zachary remained living together and Lana worked while Zachary was a stay-at-home father, but the truth was he was just having a really hard time getting a job. So at this point, Zachary was starting over at 27 with little help for his mental health and that's when he met Addie. He believed love would fix everything. He told his mom Addie was his soulmate and Lana was even happy for him that he'd found somebody and like I said, told him he could bring Addie too during the hurricane. When they didn't take her up on her offer, she actually ended up being taken to Texas to evacuate. This was with the children where she had to get a job to support them while there. But during the hurricane, as Zachary took care of Addie, he didn't realize how much of this survivor situation from the hurricane would trigger his PTSD from war. And Addie herself was being triggered when she walked into a store without electricity to get some supplies and was grabbed by a man who tried to rape her. This brought back her trauma and memories from the abuse she had gone through as a child. But they covered it well and they went on living together, they adopting stray cats, they were inviting friends over, they were taking care of everyone they could, putting off their own problems. But after the hurricane, to adjust back to normal life, they were using drugs and alcohol to cope. They were fighting and breaking up and Zachary would be kicked out where he would be homeless for a while, either sleeping on a friend's couch or finding a couch in an abandoned home to sleep in. Addie didn't appreciate that Zachary had children and that he had to watch them sometimes, so anytime that they came over, she would be out drinking all night and the children, Lily and Jackson, would actually tell their mother that Addie didn't like them. At the same time, Zachary was becoming very jealous of Addie, who would work as a bartender, and she would talk to other men to get tips. But he was telling her not to flirt with them, even if it made her more money. But Zachary said that if she continued to do so, he would start going to strip clubs and hanging out with other girls and other boys. Now, this started a huge argument between the two of them that was brought up often after this because Zachary had confided in her that he was bisexual. He was also cheating on her with the man. When Addie heard this, she was angry. She was done with him and she then called every woman in his phone telling them that Zachary had AIDS before deleting their numbers. She was also said to be using homophobic slurs, not only to Zachary, but to others as well. But she had no idea that this would be the catapult to her death. According to the journal found in the apartment, 12 days prior to Zachary and Addie's bodies being found, Zachary would say that he and Addie had an argument and Zachary told her that this time he wasn't leaving the apartment. Addie became angry at this and began to say that he humiliated her by sleeping with men. Zachary told her to shut up and she didn't. That's when he put his hands around her neck and strangled her and couldn't stop himself. Zachary wrote that when Addie was lying dead on the floor, he began to write about what happened. And he admitted in this journal that he also violated the corpse and left Addie in this 60 degree apartment to keep her from decomposing while he figured out what to do. A few days later in the journal, he described binging on cocaine while using a knife and a hacksaw, putting her body in the tub and then putting her body parts in pans and pots cooking and seasoning them. He then withdrew every penny of his savings and headed to every bar he could for the next 10 days, leading him to the Omni Hotel rooftop bar. Lana was so distraught at this that she actually took a solo road trip and this landed her in jail for a DUI, but then she went home to be with her children and she was taking them to a psychiatrist during this time. And that psychiatrist told her that she should tell Lily and Jackson exactly what their father had done. So, even though this was odd, she took this professional's advice 
and after that, her children started having nightmares. They were only seven and six. Jackson became quiet after that. Lily started drawing things that her father had done. And Lana believes that Zachary not only ruined her life, but her children's lives. She can't even go anywhere without people asking her questions. Her child's doctor even asked her, so did Zachary really eat her? Because Zachary was dubbed by the media as the Katrina cannibal, even though investigators believed that he had only cooked and seasoned the body parts to mask the flesh. No evidence was found that there was bite marks, or eaten remains of Addie, and also Zachary didn't have any meat in his stomach at the time of death. But when Zachary's body was found and those cigarette burns were all over, this was one thing that investigators didn't really understand until they read further into his note where he explained that this was a punishment, a burn for every year he had lived, 28. This also was where he would give the motive for murder, saying that he was a failure and that when Addie ended their relationship because of his bisexuality, he snapped. Now, I wish I could tell you that this is kind of where things end, but it just gets stranger after that because a year later in 2007, Zachary's friend Squirrel was a suspect in another murder. This was of Robin Malta, who was found bludgeoned to death in his apartment in New Orleans, and investigators arrested Squirrel, saying that he had sold Robin drugs. They were asking him, but he said he couldn't remember. Detectives told Squirrel that they found his hair at the crime scene, and he told them they could take any DNA samples that they wanted, but he would not be placed at that scene. He didn't do it. He then told them to either charge him with murder or release him, so they let him go. But even though he was innocent, the community did turn their backs on him, believing that he was a killer. Until two years later, when a man named Mark Ott was charged with the murder of Robin Malta instead. But by 2008, Zachary was back in the New York Times once again due to an investigation into the veterans who went to war in Iraq and Afghanistan who had come home to commit homicides. Reports had found 121 cases. Although this has been widely debated, with many saying this isn't even a high percentage of the amount of veterans. Around this time, a documentary was in the works called Zach and Addie, mainly due to the fact that they had found a friend of Zach and Addie's who was willing to be interviewed. This was a 28-year-old woman named Margaret Sanchez who said she had met Addie at the bar where they both worked. Margaret would say from that day on, Addie was her best friend, her sister, and anything that a woman could need from another woman, she could ask Addie for. It wasn't something that I could have ever imagined that would have happened because Zach was so nice. But Margaret said that after the murder of her friend, she would have nightmares about the killing and she believed that Zachary just snapped. She explained that she tried to get in Zachary's head to understand and she believed his first thought would have been, what am I going to do to get rid of the body? How was he going to fix this? She said she believed that was his first thought because that would have been her first thought. But Margaret also wondered if Addie killed herself just as Zachary did. Margaret had also gone on ABC's final witness to tell this story. However, she herself would be involved in another murder after that. You see, in 2012, around 15 months after that final witness interview, she became a prime suspect in the disappearance of a woman. This is 23-year-old Jaren Lockhart in New Orleans. She was a young mother with a three-year-old daughter and a fiance, and she worked as a dancer. She was last seen leaving her workplace, the Bourbon Street Club. However, she never returned home and her fiance reported her missing. A man and a woman were seen on CCTV footage with her on June 6th of 2012. Her coworkers claimed that they knew the man. This was a 39-year-old named Terry Speaks. And then investigators aired the CCTV to the public and that is when a man called claiming that his sister was the woman, Margaret Sanchez. They were both the last people believed to see Jaron alive. And while searching for these two, their names were given to the public and ABC contacted the authorities to tell them about this final witness interview and how it was quite strange considering she would be involved in an actual murder. Now, investigators did analyze this for a full day and the chief investigators believed that Margaret felt as though the dismemberment of Addie was actually the proper thing to do and understood what Zachary did. Now, Jaron's body would be found June 7th, 2012, washed up on the beach in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. However, it was just the torso as she was dismembered. 
The deputy chief on the case said that Margaret's interview on the dismemberment of Addie Hall was very coincidental. He said, what are the odds of knowing two people who were murdered and dismembered? Two days later, her lower leg was found and then her head. The rest of her remains were slowly washing up along the Mississippi coast. On June 12th, Terry and Margaret were arrested, and they both appeared to be in disguise with Terry's hair being orange and Margaret's being blue. Terry tried to evade arrest by jumping a fence and running into the woods, but he was caught. And then Margaret was charged with harboring Terry because he was a sex offender. Terry was charged with failing to register as a sex offender and violation of his probation involving a 14-year-old girl. He also had prior convictions of assault and domestic violence. But neither were said to be cooperative with the authorities. And when they interviewed Margaret, she claimed she didn't know that Jaron had died until the news broke. She began to tell investigators, though, that it happened in a very similar way as her best friend saying, I feel so bad for her family because I had a friend. My friend was Addie Hall. She was cut up and was cooked, and her boyfriend jumped off a hotel. We had knowledge that she was friends with a uh, somebody who had been killed in a similar fashion, but didn't realize I would be seeing it on uh, national TV. We don't anticipate anything that would help us solve our particular crime or you know, prove that uh, Morgan Sanchez is any more complicit than we believe but it may, it may give us an opportunity to know her a little bit better. But investigators then told Margaret about her boyfriend, who was Terry Speaks, who she knew as Alan. She said she felt betrayed because her life was shit before meeting this man. But she was then released from jail while awaiting charges on the harboring a sex offender, and investigators were also trying to find a way to charge her with murder. Meanwhile, Terry was kept in jail and then sent to federal prison. A year later, investigators felt as though they had enough information to move forward in the Jaron Lockhart case. However, it would likely be on charges of desecration of a human corpse rather than murder. They said they had a strong case for homicide, but they also didn't want to go through with it if they couldn't be 100% because they didn't want to let these people go free due to double jeopardy. But in 2014, Margaret and Terry, now 30 and 41, were then indicted in the killing of Jaron Lockhart by a grand jury. And fellow inmates of Terry's said that he had confessed to them he was involved. The next year, the trial began. In 2015, Terry pled not guilty and then fired his attorney, defended himself for two days, and testified for two hours saying that they had found no evidence because the crime didn't happen and they didn't do it. Prosecutors then brought in experts to take the stand on the lack of evidence saying that it only meant that they went great lengths to cover up what they had done. Phone calls were then played between Terry and Margaret who were talking about their dog, Logan, and investigators said that this was actually code for murder. So Terry was then sentenced to life in prison for second degree murder, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. But Terry then said he would refuse to testify in the trial of Margaret. In 2016, Margaret would plead guilty to the manslaughter, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to obstruct justice. The day Jaron had vanished, Margaret had gone to the club she had worked at with her boyfriend, Terry, but she knew as Alan. Now, they lured Jaron home with them, saying that they would pay her quite a bit for a private performance. They then took her back home where they stabbed her in the chest, dismembering her body and then throwing her off of a bridge. So Margaret was sentenced to 40 years for manslaughter, 40 for obstruction of justice, and 20 for conspiracy to commit murder. Today, though, the apartment where Addie was murdered has become a ghost tour site. It turned out that they had actually lived above a voodoo spiritual temple, which was on the city's registry of historic places. And due to this, there was said to be some darkness, some spiritual entities that some people believed in. And they believed this could have actually been the reason for Zach's mental illness due to that dark voodoo. Because for years after Addie's murder, tenants would move into that apartment and say that they had experienced paranormal activities such as voices, feelings of being watched. So it was then turned into a museum of the paranormal with tours. But those who don't believe that Zachary's mental illness was brought on by this voodoo believe that it was due to his PTSD and war flashbacks mixed with his drug use and toxic abusive relationship that all were just a fatal combination. But if Zachary had gotten help for his PTSD after discharge, do you think this could have been prevented altogether? But why the dismemberment and the cooking, the lack of remorse, 
Was this also PTSD or was this some sort of psychosis brought on by his drug and alcohol benders? Did he ever start to come out of this delusion and realize what he had done? Is that when he decided to take his own life too? Or was this just an angry man who couldn't stand being judged for his sexuality, who brutally killed his girlfriend and then didn't want to be punished for it? Overall, I think one of the huge things that this case points to is to the lack of help of veterans for their mental illness and also just their lives after they come back from the war and literally fighting to survive. Not that that has officially been directly pointed to as motive or the reason that Addie was murdered and dismembered, but there was a lot of struggle that started from that PTSD and the root could have been helped so many years prior. I will list the Veterans Crisis Hotline down below if you or someone that you know needs it. And please let me know if there's any way that we can help to give assistance to veterans, especially for mental health and mental illness. Being in the military is not an excuse for Zachary Bowen to have killed Addie Hall and dismembered her body, but it is the heartbreaking first steps of his downfall. I think Zachary deserved help. I think that Addie deserved help for what she had gone through in her past, the abuse she had went through, the anger, and the dark spells that she would endure when she was drinking. And it's heartbreaking that this is how it ended. But what do you think about their best friend who then went on to allegedly murder another person in the same manner? The fact that she was trying to put herself in the killer's head during the interview and then actually became the killer 15 months later. Overall, I hope this case is just a reminder that you deserve help and you might have to fight for it. You might have to go through several different therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists to find the right one or the one who believes you or treats you well, but that does not mean you should give up. Don't let it spiral out of control. Don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay.